I am here to introduce to you Shirley Wilson. Uh, she's the author of several family histories, author of Sumner County record books, volunteer director of the Sumner County Archives for seven years, and founding member of the Sumner County Public Records Commission. She was a genealogy teacher for 25 years at Volunteer State Community College, and former president of Middle Tennessee Genealogical Society, Sumner County Historical Society, and the Hendersonville Library Friends. She retired in 2008. She was a certified genealogist for 30 years. Currently, she volunteers at the Summer County Archives, the Tennessee State Library, and the Tennessee State Archives. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Shirley Wilson. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, and Kay invited me to speak. Um, I pulled the lecture title out of the air, Genealogy Then and Now, uh, it turned out to be perfect. I am the then, and since I pulled that lecture title out, I have met the now. The now is named Trey, and you will hear some more about him as we go through this. Um, there's so much about genealogy to learn, but teaching it anymore is really difficult. There's so many websites, there's so much information, it's just like information overload. So it's hard to put it all together. When I taught genealogy as a class, it was an eight week course, and it was two hours for each session, so that's 16 hours, so we're, you know, compressing all that into one one session. Um, and I want to uh, find out if there's actual beginners in here. That's what I need to know. Um, beginners today can go from knowing nothing to knowing a whole lot in like two or three weeks time. That didn't happen because there was no place to go to get the information. Now you've got the internet and it's amazing how much you can learn and how quickly. So let me ask, are there people here who really feel like they're total beginners in genealogy? Okay, a few, okay, a few. And, and I think of that, um, one of the things that a beginner does and it's, actually a mistake that they make so I'll talk about that first on and that is the spelling of your surname and the pronunciation of it beginners assume that your surname is your surname and it doesn't change it just keeps going back that is not necessarily true and the spelling of it although it's very important to you it really does it matter to the county clerk 200 years ago who wrote it down, saying it like you pronounced it, which, or spelling it like you pronounced it. So it may be wrong, is what I'm saying. And um, a good example of that here in Sumner County is the surname Osbrooks. It's spelled A-U-S-B-R-O-O-K-S. And if you look for it under that name, you will miss a lot of records that are filed under OZ Brooks. And that is what I'm trying to get across to you is how very different your surname might be spelled than what you anticipate. And you really need to be thoughtful about how it could be misspelled. Knight, for instance, could become N-I-G-H-T and you'll miss it in an index that's the case. Uh, I have a really good example in my own family. My um, husband's mother's surname was Siebenthaler. Now, I'm not saying Siebenthaler like they have here in Nashville, but in Dayton, Ohio, it's Siebenthaler, and it means seven valleys. And they came to Indiana in 1825. We know exactly where they came to, a specific county, a specific township. I could not find them. I could not find them in the census. I could not find them. 
could not find them in the marriage records. I could not find them in the deeds. So one time I sat down at a microfilm reader. That's how we used to do census. You couldn't go to Ancestry.com. You had to get a microfilm and put it on a reader and crank through. So I crank through this particular township looking for this family. I didn't find any semen dollars, but I had the Bible record with the names of the children in order. And as I was cranking through, I was looking at anything that began with S. The name was in there as seven dollars. <laughs> It was in the indexes at $7. It wasn't a slip. They went by the name $7 from 1820 to 1860. Then they moved to Dayton, Ohio. By the time they got to Dayton, Ohio, they knew, they spoke English for one thing, and they knew how their name was spelled. And forever after, it was Siebenthal. And when I found that, I went home and told my husband, you don't know how lucky you are that your name isn't $7 because they went to Ohio. If they had stayed in Indiana, the name would have probably continued that way. But that's why I say, be innovative. You need to be innovative. I was one of the lucky ones because I started really young it, as a teen doing genealogy, and um, I had a grandmother who um, taught me a lot about the family. And there have been major changes in my life uh, in genealogy. I've probably seen more changes over the years. And the first one that came along was Roots. The movie um, showed in I think I looked it up, January 1977, it was on TV. At that time we lived in the Chicago area and we were, um, I was already very involved and there's a library there called Newbury Library in the downtown of Chicago. We were in the suburbs. But I would go there and I would take friends. Uh, snow in Chicago doesn't slow anybody down. We, we went in some snowstorms that you would not believe, driving down 40 miles into Chicago. But um, I went by myself right after Roots was on TV, and um, I, saw, I saw the movie and, and I found it very interesting, but I did know mentally as a genealogist that it made it look easy. It didn't, it didn't convey to people that this is not, not easy, especially African American genealogy. It's hard. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Anyway, I went down to the Newberry Library right after it was um, on TV, and um, usually at the library, there would be maybe one or two other patrons there, other than whoever came with me at that time. That was nobody. I went in, the room was full. There wasn't hardly a place to sit. I did finally found a place to sit, and set about doing my genealogy, and I could sense people looking at me. <laughs> and um, finally, the gentleman sitting next to me, um, Lee, already said, are you doing your family history? And I said, yes, that I was. And he said, how do you do it? <laughs> and I thought, how do I, and at that point, I was not a professional. I had never done African American genealogy at all. I have since a lot, but not then. So I gathered what I could gather and told him what I, I could tell him, but um, that was an interesting point in my life. From there, we moved to Tennessee. Um, one of the first things I did after I got to Tennessee was to visit the Tennessee State Library and Archives. If you have not been there, you should go. It is an amazing facility, even back then, and this was 77 when I moved here. Um, the biggest thing that they have there, 
and the importance to genealogists is they have microfilm records from every county in Tennessee. Wills, marriages, court records, um, almost anything you would need as a genealogist for any county in Tennessee is at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Now, how many have Tennessee roots? Anybody? Ah, quite a few, quite a few. Sometimes I'll ask that question. Nobody does. They're all from you know other areas. You need to go to Tennessee State Library and look at those microfilms because there's lots of them, and all those county records are there. They also have a very good collection of published records, and they have records for all the surrounding states and counties within those states. The further you get away from Tennessee, the fewer records they have. If your roots are from Maine, nah, you're not going to find much. It's, but it is a really good source of information. And then came, after that, the advent of computers and the advent of the internet and Ancestry.com. All of those were really major changes in how you did genealogy. Uh, gone are your, um, your cranking through the microfilms, which uh, was a blessing. I was really glad to see that go. Now I want to tell you just a little bit about um, the then, which is me, and um, the now, which is Trey. Um, we were both, Trey is a 16 year old um, boy, I should say, young man, and I happened to be volunteering at Ball State for something. He too was there. And um, I think he might have had some uh, Mexican, South American, I'm not sure what, um, but we got to talking and he was so excited and wanted to tell me about his new hobby. He knew nothing about my background. And he was telling me how much he had learned and he had just started and he had found um, six or seven generations on his family. And he whipped out his um, cell phone. And he said, look here what I found. And he's got everything on his cell phone. And I thought, okay, this is now. I am now standing next to now. I told him uh, of my background, and um, he's not here, so I can say his chin literally dropped. Have you ever seen anybody go? <laughs> he was just, and he said, "Can I ask you some questions?" <laughs> well, of course, you know I did. We had a really good time, but I thought, how cool is that? That he is so excited about it. That made me happy, and it's just nice to see. My kids are not excited about it at all. So, okay, um, I asked him how he got started and he told me he talked with an aunt and she gave him the family information and that is exactly how everybody should start. They should talk to their relatives and find out what they already know. Now, I'm not saying everybody does it that way. Probably most people don't anymore, but that kid at 16 had figured out how to do this. That was my point of going from not knowing much to knowing a whole lot really quick. He sure did it. Um, and do not ask me how to put your genealogy on the telephone. <laughs> We're gonna have a question and answer after this is over, but don't ask me that, I don't know. I'm lucky I can get my messages, much less put my genealogy on the telephone. I do understand that your cell phone has more computing power than when they put the man on the moon. I remember reading that somewhere, and I'm sure that's true, but I'm just glad I can get my, my uh, messages out. Uh, what I hope to do is, is, is make sure that the people are, who are new don't make the huge mistakes that most people do when they first start out. One of them was the one we talked about with the surname. 
the second mistake, and if you take just one thing away today, let it be this, and I know you're going to hate me for this, but Ancestry.com is a marvelous research tool. It is not a source, unless you are looking at their digitized records. And they've got some wonderful digitized records, like the census records. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the family inputted data um, and the trees and all of those things, they're not necessary. You can't take them to the bank. Let's put it that way. Use them, but try to prove them from other sources so that you are sure of what you've got. And don't, um, and this is, this is another mistake that beginners often make, uh, and that's failing to document where you got your information. Two years from now, you won't remember, and you'll be really sorry because you'll find contrasting information. So document what you have, even if it's only to say, um, a person's name and identify that person as your aunt or your grandmother or, or something like that. That's good documentation. And that pool of what I call pristine information that young people have, don't let, don't let it get mixed up with Ancestry.com. If you put something in from Ancestry that doesn't have another source, just say Ancestry.com, which means that's not really a source. At least it does to me. Um, and I'll tell you a couple stories really quick so that you'll understand why that's important. Um, I got in touch with a cousin just recently, and um, my first cousin, I was talking with her. She's quite a bit older than I am. And she said, oh, I'm so excited. My daughter had, she's been a genealogist all of her life, but she says, my daughter has found a lot of things on our Rudy one. And my maiden name is Rudy. That is not a particularly common name. It's unusual. So I was excited about it, too. Um, and this gal's name is Peg. I said, tell Peg I'll call her. And she told me, um, that she had, what she had found. And I said, Peg, I hate to tell you this, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. And um, I said, where'd you get that information? Well, it was Ancestry.com. And I went through my, my information that I had had, and sure enough, I had seen what she saw and what Ancestry.com had picked up. I didn't think it was right. I investigated. I found and proved it was not right. So I had to tell her, no, that's not right. And then she admitted that she had a lot of things from Ancestry.com that she hadn't checked out. And she said, well, surely I guess I'm going to have to go through those and make sure they're right. I said, that would be a good approach. Um, and another one that happened that was even more, more um, clear was that I have an ancestor named James Eli Hankins. He was born in 1876 in January. And um, he was born in Indiana, came to Ohio, went to Pittsburgh to look for a job, as I've been told family lore. He vanished completely just vanished. This is like 1925. I found him in a city directory there, living with uh, two or three men, and um, then he vanished. And with all the knowledge that I have, I could not find that man, never could find him. And then one day, searching using Ancestry.com, there he was. Um, Somebody had found a death date for him. Well, I was really, really excited. And I went to the Ohio, it was in Ohio, it was in Cincinnati, which is very close to Dayton. Uh, I was really excited about it. And in the Ohio death index, 
there was a man named James E. Hankins, born in January. That's kind of him. But um, I sent for the death certificate. Um, apparently, the person who had found that information put it in to Ancestry.com without looking at the death certificate. When I got the death certificate, first off, the the day of birth was wrong, which is minor, that could be. But also, the parents were listed, and they were wrong. And the race was wrong. So all told, you know, you've got to check things out. You can't rely on what's in there as fact. Somebody saw that in that Ohio death in index and jumped to that conclusion. That's exactly what happened. They never bothered to check it out. Two sources that you need to explore as a beginner are the census records which, and, and vital records. The census records 1790 to the last release is 1940. Um, the 1890 census is mostly destroyed. Ancestry.com has whatever's left of it. But it's not, it's not a really good source because it's mostly destroyed. But they also have the agricultural schedules, which can tell you what kind of farm your, if, if your ancestor has a farm, what they're growing, what their uh, livestock is, that sort of thing. And there's also a uh, manufacturing schedule. And there are slave schedules for 1850 and 1860. Um, the U.S. edition of Ancestry.com costs about $190.89, I think. And that will give you everything you need. But that's a year subscription. And if you don't want to spend that much, you can get a month. Or you can go to the Tennessee State Library and Archives, which has it free to patrons, and you can use that. Um, I have a sub subscription, and um, I, I enjoy it very much. But um, if I was just doing, you know, my own family, I probably would use the State Library. The um, Summer County Archives has a lot of records, but they don't have Ancestry.com, and there's a really good reason for that. I was shocked. We investigated it. Bonnie, Bonnie is the uh, director at the Summer County Archives, and um, it was it was two thousand dollars. Was it that two thousand dollars? Wow. Um, okay, <laughs> that's why we didn't get it. A year. A <laughs> year. Right. Um, so that, you know, the Tennessee State Library and Archives can afford that. Uh, local libraries aren't likely to want to pay that much for it. But it can be really helpful. And um, most people are in the census. Although people say they can't find their ancestors in the census, I'm going to say most of the time they're there, you just don't recognize them. Maybe there's a marriage in there that's changed things. Um, Summer County's 1870 census is a really good example. And if you have people in Summer County, the 50, 60, and 70 census have been, has been transcribed by volunteers and it's available in book format at the Southern County Archives. It's excellent because the people that did it knew the names and fixed them. 1870 was especially bad, and there's a reason for that. That was after the Civil War. Uh, the census takers, I finally checked them because I couldn't understand why it was so bad. All the census takers were born in, in were not born in Tennessee. They came from eastern states, carpet baggers, I suppose, but um, they did a very poor job of transcribing the census. And what we did, with the help of Ken Thompson, 
who, who knows everything about Sumner County. As we went through and found, figured out the names and corrected them in the census index. You can't change the census. That's not a good thing to do. But we put the corrected names in the census with a reference to see such and such. So you could find your family there. Um, there were a lot of um, a lot of mistakes that were made, and you can imagine that someone from Maine trying to understand a Tennessee accent would have a little bit of difficulty. That was the problem we figured. The uh, vital records are a little more complicated. I've got some water here and I need it. This is because a lot of that vital records are considered um, confidential and that makes it difficult to get them. Marriages are the easiest and also you need to know that in the northern states they started um, keeping records on vital records much earlier than they did in Tennessee. So if you've got a Tennessee or a Southern family and one guy went north, um, get after him because you might find a death certificate for him that you wouldn't be able to find in Tennessee because they didn't keep them that early. But the Northerners um, did a good job on starting to keep records early. So the marriage records are the easiest, um, and the counties kept them before the states. Um, Tennessee has transferred most of the, um, not the rec not the marriages, the marriages remain in the county. And they, then later, they kept them at the state level. So every state is going to be different as when they started keeping records in the county. All the counties are different. Um, Summer County has marriage records from 1787, but most counties don't have them that early. 1836 is kind of a breakoff point because that's when they were required to keep marriages in uh, bound volumes. The ones before 1836 got discarded, but not in Summer County. So you will find this very different in every every single state. Uh, the birth records are probably the hardest to get. I used to say you have to know everything on there before you can get one. Um, you can get your own. Um, you, you can get your, your people who are your direct ancestors. You can get that, but you have to know a lot of information for the, for the recent ones to get that. They just don't uh, release those. Some states do. Uh, death indexes are online by states. Uh, in many cases, there are even online death certificates. Not Tennessee, but at least not that I've seen yet. Who knows? <laughs> uh, there may be some coming that, but look for um, Google like if you're looking for Iowa, Iowa State um, Death Index and things like that will pop up for you. In Tennessee, um, there's a, a listing on your list of internet sources that shows a, a site in Memphis <coughs> to find death certificates all over the state. That is because Memphis had wanted their own and theirs were mixed in, so they created a whole death index for Tennessee, which, which is very handy. Uh, the Social Security Death Index is another place that you can find recent information, and it's really good. Uh, but keep in mind that there was no social Social Security until the late 18th, 1930s. So it's not going to do you any good in the, for early information, but it is there for later. 
DNA is definitely a now thing. Um, and I don't profess to be an expert on DNA, but I do know the basics. Um, I'm sure that there are people in the audience probably that know more than I do, but um, I am curious to know how many have had their DNA checked? Quite a few, not a huge number, but quite a few. How many were happy with their results? <laughs> well, yeah, I figured it'd be a little less. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Pardon? You, if you did some genealogy on your family and you know that you got Ireland or England or Scotland or whatever, it doesn't surprise you when you see your DNA, except there's some other places in the world that come from. Yeah, well, <laughs> That's I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna t try to talk to you enough about that um, and the, and the, another question quickly I'll ask, and then I'll, I'll get to that. Um, those of you who did have your DNA checked, how many of you know what kind of DNA you had checked? Not who did the checking, but the kind of DNA that you had checked. Okay, not that many, but a few. Um, and that's what I really wanted to tell you about so that those of you who haven't had a check will know what to look for. I'm always surprised that so few people, they'll, they'll say, well, I have Ancestry.com. And I said, no, no, I mean, what kind of DNA did they search for? Did they search, you know, what kind? And they don't know that. Um, autosomal DNA is supposed to be a little bit from your mother and a little bit from I usually tell people if they want their ethnicity, which most people do, that's a good way to do it. Um, do the autosomal DNA. Ancestry.com will do it. There's other places that do it. But it's a little pinch of each. Now, what I don't think is that I think you could have it tested again, autosomal, and the pinches might be different, and you get a little bit different ethnicity. When I did mine, it came back 94% Western Europe, which is basically Germany and Switzerland, and that area. And that's my father. Exactly, that's my father. Where was my mother? <laughs> and I thought, this doesn't seem right. And then I had my MT DNA check. That's mother. Okay. Women can only get the MT DNA. Men can have the Y DNA and the, the mother. So if the if the male has the Y DNA, it goes father to father to father to father. If you get the MT DNA, your mother, it goes mother mother to mother to mother. If you look at that chart, that pedigree chart, and picture it filled out with your names, you'll see that you're going up each side of the chart. And there's all these people in the middle. None of those people in the middle <coughs> are in those searches. So the male on his Y DNA can goes way back, it doesn't mean if you find another male with the same Y chromosome that you're descended from. Because five generations back, maybe your ancestor had nine brothers. They'll all have the same Y DNA. And so it helps where you found a bunch of your people over here, and then you found another by the surname over here, and you're thinking, which one is mine? That's where the Y DNA really comes into play, and it really can tell you which group you're descending from, because the DNA, the Y DNA, is going to be different from those two different groups. So maybe one's from Virginia, the other's from North Carolina, you're from Tennessee. And that will help you a whole lot in your research. Um, and a good example is that of, is the name Bingham. I did a lot of work for a man who was from a county 
out in West Tennessee years ago. He came back to me when DNA became popular and he had had his DNA checked. And the adjoining county had men over there named Bingham. And so he had me check that county. Couldn't find anything. Couldn't. It was like he disappeared. And I kept telling him, we maybe should check Bingham and check some similar names. No. He was absolutely sure it's Bingham. There's no two ways about it. Don't bother with that. When he got his DNA checked, that whole group of people in the next county, absolutely not, completely not related to him. Totally not. But the, the, the ones he got back were from a certain area in Pennsylvania, and they were Bingham's, B-I-G-G-A-M-S. So that's how genealogy can help you. Um, he spent a lot of money having me search that adjacent county, and it was wrong. He found a man there who had, was descended from the early pioneers in that particular county. That's how he found that out. So that's how it can help you on the Y DNA. And the mtDNA, It helped me when I went back later and I had the <laughs> mtDNA and I did it with the same company and I figured that's when my DNA changed, my ethnicity changed. So they didn't get a big enough hunk of my mother when they did the combination. Eventually it came back with 54% um, uh, Northern Ireland England for my mother. And that combined with the other is how it changed my my pie that, that they had sent to me. And I took me a long time to figure it out because it changed and I couldn't understand why it could change. And then it dawned on me that um, I, I did that with the same company and they probably combined it. That's my assumption because it was very, it was very, very different. Um, does that give you an idea of what that whole thing is about and how it can help you? Because it can't. Um, the other thing that I have in that packet that I gave you was a family group sheet. And um, I know that's old fashioned and out of date, but I still use them. Uh, I use it as a, a worksheet to put, put it all together. That's my right. Right. No, You're good. I'm going to write out the because some people did. Okay. Yeah. Um, Most people are using a program. I too use programs, but I find it, um, I find the worksheet just handy. When I start a new family, to put it on there, and sometimes I even use different colored pencils to put things in so that I know where what my roots are, or where what my, um, my source is. Um, and if, if you are not wanting to use it, just throw it away. If you do, take it and get copies somewhere, and, and that may help you. I also have some, what I call quick fixes. When you hit that brick wall and you just don't know what to do next, that would be something for the folks that aren't beginners, because anyone who is a beginner is a long way from a brick wall. There's so many sources out there. I can't even begin to tell you all the various sources that are available. But the two things we talked about were census <coughs> records and vital records. And that's where you need to start when you're a beginner. Get that hardcore information. When, um, when I'm up against a brick wall and I don't know what to do, I start to put the family together in a narrative format as if I'm going to publish it, whether or not I am. And what that does for me is it tells me, it alerts
alerts me to what I've missed. If I've got a marriage that I failed to get, I can see it when it's in a narrative format. And if I fail to document something or if I missed a census, not gotten every single census out of that one. So that's one of the things I do um, when I'm stuck. Another thing is if you haven't done it already, learn the history of the state that you're working in and learn the history of the county. That can make a huge difference. Summer County, for example, I keep using that, but that's, that's my home county and I, I um, know a lot about that county. It was formed in um, 1786 and at that time it was huge. It covered um, Wilson County. It covered the northern part of Rutherford County. Eastwards, it went clear over to Pickett County. Pickett County is where um, the lake is. Uh, Dale Hollow Lake, that's Pickett County. It went that far over. So all those counties in between were once part of Southern County. If your person is um, was living here in the time period um, prior to 1800. They might have a marriage recorded here because there was no other place for them to record it. The counties weren't formed. Around 1800, uh, Wilson County formed and then Rutherford and uh, Smith County was over there for uh, east of us. So learn that in whatever state you're working in, in whatever county. Learn the history of the county. That will help you immensely. Um, I would say the next thing would be go there. Go there. Now, that used to be very significant because you didn't have access to what you have now on the internet and um, Ancestry.com. But it's still important. Go to the county, visit the cemeteries, go to the library, because the library will have things that are nowhere else in this world. Summer County Archives um, has the major genealogical collection for Summer County, and they have um, <coughs> family vertical files, um, a whole cabinet full, don't they? About a cabinet full. Excellent source. Yeah. And um, some of those are families that are not from Sumner County, but a ma majority of them are from Sumner County. And people have donated those and they've been placed in family files. You'll find that in most states and in most counties that the library has a tremendous collection. They also have old newspapers, which is another valuable research tool. Um, let's see, what else do I want to cover? Oh, well, when you're there, you will also want to um, look at the land records. And um, I used to, when I left the county, stop by the telephone company and picked up a phone book. Uh, you don't do that anymore, but you would post on their, the city or the county's internet sites you're interested in a particular family. So that's a good source. And the land records uh, come in two basic forms meets and bounds, that's what we have here in Summer County, and that's what most of the, of the um, states that were formed before the Revolutionary War, um, they, um, they are um, imprecise, is, is the meets and bounds system. In the states that were formed after the Revolutionary War, they measured them, they have township and ranges. If you, how many of you have lived in a state that has township and ranges? Okay, not that many, I'm surprised. Um, people have asked me, 
which form is better for genealogy? Well, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to walk on the land, you better hope you're in the, the township and range because that is a very precise measurement. You can have, you can go to the county seat and get a map. It shows the townships and ranges and the uh, sections and go to the deed office and you can get the precise place. You can put your finger on the land just about. You can drive out. And if any, you've flown, uh, I'm sure, if you fly over the uh, township and range land, you can look down and you can see the squares. Um, and then you get into flying over Tennessee and you see this maze of tangle of roads and things. So it's very visible from the air which states have the township and ranges. But for genealogy, I love the meets and bounds system. And that's because they will say, because it is so imprecise, they will say um, 20 poles to the corner of John Harrison's property. Or this is the land my grandfather purchased from Howard Johnson when in 19 or in 1802 or something. Those kinds of comments will be in the meets and bounds deeds. And they're wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, I also want to tell you about a project that's going to be done in Sumner County and is being done as we speak. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, Jack Masters' books. I uh, see some heads shaking. Um, he has done a number of them, and the first one was done with Bill Pereira and um, another uh, gentleman who's... Doug Drake. Hmm? Doug Drake. Doug Drake, yes. The three of them did the one on Sumner County in the, the very first one. Um, Jack continued on, and eventually they did three of those great big um, coffee table books. And then Jack did another group of books down in the Elk River area of Tennessee. And then he finally said, well, I guess I'll do what you wanted me to do, Shirley. Which was, once, well, you can kind of see, like this is, a, this is a picture of, from the book, and it, it was spotty. What he did is he took, they took the North Carolina grants that came from North, the state of North Carolina for land in Tennessee. And they took those grants and they put them on USGS maps. But it left a lot of holes because it's like doing a giant jigsaw puzzle without a boundary and with nothing, pieces unattached. So they did the best they could with the North Carolina grants. And all along I've been hoping that they would do um, the Tennessee grants and fill in the areas that were missing in Sumner County. <coughs> they have done that. Um, my job in this was to encourage Jack <coughs> when he got discouraged and help where I could. He didn't need a lot of help and he sure didn't need a lot of encouragement. He's a very enthusiastic person. Anyway, he put all this together and um, it is now being indexed. So we will have an index of all the land in Sumner County with a place index as well. So the names of the people who got the grants, the chain carriers who were probably uh, relatives, the neighbors, and then all the identifying uh, Greeks, this particular map has one place on it where it makes reference to um, Morris Cabin, where Mary Ferguson lives. Now there's probably nowhere on earth that you would find that out except in these records. This is an amazing collection that will soon be available at the Sumner County Archives. Don't go there quite yet, because it's not ready yet index is not finished, 
but it will be. Do we have some, we have some summer canyons, don't we here? Huh? Some? No? Yes? Okay, good. <laughs> I thought we had a few. Anyway, this is going to be a wonderful thing when it's finished, and I'm really excited about it. In particular, um, I had a family that I was searching up in this area, the Notch. You know where the Notch is? You know Tennessee's and Kentucky's border goes across like this, and then it takes a dip down here, and it goes back up. This land where these people lived, um, Mitchellville and Mitchell's Crossroads, um, that's where this Mitchell family lived. And these have been really, really helpful in putting all this together. And we did a seminar um, about a week ago up in Portland. And afterward, Jack and I drove over to the um, to Mitchell's Crossroads, and I am sorry to say, it's not there anymore. Um, they're building a road across northern Sumner County, and it goes right through Mitchell's Crossroads, which is really sad. We were driving along expecting to see Mitchell's Crossroads, and we suddenly saw orange cones blocking the road so that you couldn't go through. So. Mitchellville is still there, but Mitchell's Crossroads is still gone. But we will have this to show at least where it was. Okay, um, I have a section um, here on African American, and um, since we only have, I think, one or two, I'm going to skip that part and um, do that later. Uh, I guess one piece of advice I would give to you in, in closing before we have the questions and answers is um, a piece of advice that if you want to be sure that your children don't throw your genealogy work of a lifetime away, publish it. I don't mean you necessarily have to put it go to a publisher. You can self-publish anymore. I think I, I think I brought one along just to show you. Yeah. Very inexpensive. You can get 20 copies. You can get five copies. But your kids can't throw this away because you don't throw books away. So I figure I'm safe. <laughs> They will throw my files away. I know they will. They'll look at them and they won't know what to do with them and they'll roll they'll go out. But they won't throw the books away. And I have distributed them to enough of them that it will survive. But I'm telling you, they'll throw them away. So be aware of that. <laughs> um, okay, do we have some questions? Surely somebody's got a question. Yeah. You mentioned the census went from what year did you, you say up to 1940? It went, it goes on up to the present time, okay. as, as you know. But the last one released is 1940 mm -hmm. that you can actually look at on Ancestry.com. Um, Why can't we look at part of the others released at a certain amount of time? Yeah, yeah, and on the, let's see, what is this? This is 17. We're, we're due to get another census release fairly soon. Every 10 years, they release another set of records. When they released the 1940 census, um, they asked for volunteers to um, <coughs> index it. And I, I think I didn't mention that all of these census records on Ancestry.com are fully indexed, not just head of also. Every person in the house is listed. And um, that's, that's a wonderful tool, especially if, say, your ancestor is John Smith. You better hope he has a brother, you know, Cecil or Egelbert or something like that, because you're not going to find a John Smith easily uh, and make and know that he's yours.
but if he has a brother two years older named Egelbert or you know one of those unusual names you will find it and that's part of the reason you have those family group sheets if you have a whole family you can spot that family in a census whereas you might not be able to pick up one person and know that he's the right person Other questions? Okay. If I can relate to the question of publishing your, your work, uh, if you have a, a subscription to Ancestry.com and you don't pay up the next year, they will just discard your whole free, is that correct? Uh, I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you can have Ancestry.com in your computer as a program to hold your genealogy. That won't go away if you've got it in your computer. If you entered stuff it. online, no, it, it won't go away. I um, thought all that was up on the, in the cloud, but maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I think, I think you are. Um, you Because you can have Ancestry.com as a genealogy program that's not connected with the online thing. I printed off a lot of mine when I knew that I what? Was, I knew that I was gonna have to close my computer down. Uh -huh. And I'm not good at a computer for sure. But I had done found a lot that I thought yeah, was correct right. and I printed it. And so I the printed copy is what I'm looking at now. Because I don't have my computer yep. up and I'm not, no, I'm no longer Ancestry.com, but I don't have the most current address. But what I have is about a year old almost. But uh, if, once you find it, you can print it off. And, and know, that would be a good, very good thing to do. I think in all the genealogy I have done over the years, I always make a hard copy. Um, my information is filed by the name of the client um, so that I can find it again because someone would might call me up and say I want you to do some more work I may have worked on five families for them so their information is under you know and I have a, a cross index so that I can find that information but they're not going to remember what family I worked on they're gonna you know, so it'll be under their name um, but I don't really know for certain on that, but I would certainly advise that if you do have information that might disappear, either print it out or use, um, use an online uh, program that stays there, like uh, Family Tree. Family Search? Yeah. Those, those stay there and they don't go away. The program I use is actually goes back so far because um, you know when computers first came out as I'm sure a few of you know you know they just sat there they didn't do anything you had to know you had to know what to do and um, so I remember we were working with Sumner County Records and trying to alphabetize it wouldn't even alphabetize my husband had to write a, a program to make it alphabetize so later, when it did a little more, he went in and designed a program for me to use to store my genealogy. I'm still using that program. People will ask, what, what do you use to store the program? Well, it's my old program from 30 years ago. It still works, and it does the job. And, uh, but I always print out a hard copy. Uh, that way, I figure I've got both. I've got it in the computer. Yes. What is the, um, where, I'm sorry, how far back is the longest amount of time that you've been able to go back on someone? How far back have I gone? Yes. Well, I have a chart at home which the uh, LDS printed years ago. They don't print that chart anymore. It starts with Adam, 
and it goes down to the king lines. And I used to bring it to, I didn't even think about it, I should have brought that. Um, it was kind of a kick because um, it went down to the king lines. If you can't um, get back to a king line, you can't go back beyond hmm, 1100 because they didn't have surnames. And if you don't have surnames, it's pretty hard to check, you know, trace will in a whole country. Uh, it just doesn't work. Personally, um, for a friend, once I traced him back to a book that said 12 lines to Alfred the Great or something like that. And I had the genealogy chart that was from Adam that had that person on them. But that was for, you know. Um, personally, I, I think I did the best on my husband's Siebenthaler family because they knew exactly where that family came from in Germany, Vinzone was a village, it was like saying Centerville, I was told, and there were four of them, but it didn't take me too long to figure out which one was right because the records for the Siebenthal, Siebenthaler family were there. And in Germany, I man, if you got German ancestors, forget about the war, they kept good records, and they kept them in two places usually. So if you can go back to Germany, you can get to the church in the village, if you know the village, and that's what I did. And in Germany, it seemed like the little villages had one church. They didn't have, like we have seven churches to figure out who has the records. They had one. And apparently, if you lived in that village, you went to that church and your records were there. So I could trace them back, and the, la the village to village, because they told where they came from. And then in one church, it, it told how they came from Sun in Switzerland in 1700. And I went back, I went to Sun and, and the records were there. And they, um, the name became von, von Siebenthal, but it was the same family because in the one place they said they left and in the other place said they came from Sun in Switzerland. So that goes back to about 1500, I think, and I could prove it. Now, a lot of people, people have come into the Sumner County Archives and left saying they went back to 800. Can't, can't be, it can't be. But I'm not going to argue if, if they want to believe that, um, because they didn't have surnames. So, that answer your question? Okay. Yes? The DNA, my sister has had hers checked. Is there any point in me having mine checked? Do you know what kind she had checked? No. Well, I mean, I can ask her. It, it, sh it should be very similar. There may be slight differences. I am told that. Um, and I'm not sure why that is, but every person gets a different, a doctor could probably explain this better, but every person gets a different collection of what their parents have. So it won't be identical, but it'd probably be so close that it's... It came out kind of like we were expecting it to be. I mean, we knew we had some ancestor from Italy, and it didn't really mention much about that, but we really think that our Italian ancestors may have come from Spain. <laughs> they may have been some kind of gypsies, I don't know. <laughs> well, yours would be probably a little different, but I would think that hardly worth the, the money to do it. It's just not going to be that. Well, I'll figure out I'm going to spend money on something. <laughs> Especially the ethnicity, it's probably going to be very similar. It should be. It should be. But like I say, I'm not an expert in that field. I, I just know. She had a gun on ancestry, whatever she did, and it did say, you're probably related to these people that we know we are related to who have had the test. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. 
And a lot of those um, where they have a surname that um, you can sign up to be a part of a surname group, I think those are probably really helpful um, because they're working on a particular, and they probably have different, because like Wilson is such a common name. Um, oh, Smith. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I should tell you about my Wilsons. Because I worked so hard on them for so many years, and then um, the internet came along, and I had made a list of about six men that were brothers, and they had, one of them had a really odd name. And one day I was just sitting there in my pajamas in the morning, and I plugged that odd name of the, one of the brothers, and up pops a family group sheet with, out of my six or seven that I thought were brothers, just because they married, they uh, intermarried with other families and they signed uh, marriage uh, bonds, that sort of thing. It, it was just guesswork, but up popped the family group sheet and it had five of my six siblings on this sheet with their parents. And it went back three generations. And although the proof wasn't there, she told me enough that I could go and get the proof. And it took me back three generations. Wilson, and his name was John. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. That was, that was my biggest internet find, I think. Our ancestors don't help us any because we're Thomas and Thomas and John Thomas and then John John or something of the sort. I mean, they carry that same name. And it's yes. so hard to differentiate yes. which and who they're talking about. Yeah. I have a will from one East Tennessee County, and the man was Alexander something. And in his will, he says, to my son John, Alexander, it, I mean, it, it created about five grandchildren with the same name. And I thought, how are they ever going to sort that out? But, you know, it's, it's genealogy. It's fun. Any more questions? Yeah. <coughs> this Newberry Library that you mentioned in Chicago, is mm -hmm. that specifically for genealogy? Is it just a branch library? or It's, it's a genealogical library. One of and back then this this is this is the 1970s. There were very few um, sizable genealogical collections, and the Newberry Library was well known for that. Uh, they had free parking in front, and they had right in front of the library was a place known, if any of you are from Chicago, Bughouse Square, where um, you could free speech. You could put your soapbox down and climb up and start talking. And I would come out of the library and there was always somebody out there spewing something about something. I tried to kind of ignore them. But the place around it, you could park free. So that was something in Chicago. Do you spell but that B-E-R-R-Y or B-U-R-Y? N-E-W. I'm not sure if it's B-E-R-R-Y or B-U-R-Y right now. I think it's B E R R Y. <coughs> yeah. Okay. And it's still there. Okay. Yeah. I just like a comment on one thing. But I, I've been doing it for 30, 40 years. I know you have. Um, people have a tendency to want to find a rich and famous ancestor. <laughs> yes. And I have a Wilson story. Okay. And it's also a, a DNA story. Uh huh. In the DNA study that was done for me, came up with about four or five fairly close cousins. And one of them I contacted, and he sent me his family tree, and it went back five generations, uh, and we met up about five generations, and it was a Wilson. And he claimed that this Wilson was a daughter of the man who founded a Wilson shipping company, a very successful company. Mm. Yet the data that I had, and a colleague that was working with me, pointed out that the Wilson was actually lived in a hobble in the, in the Morbid's Estates, and it was written up about how bad this place was. 
So there was no way that this was the Wilson woman was the Wilson this fellow thought she was. <laughs> so you do have to be very careful. Yes. And yes. on the other hand, you also have to be very careful about what you what you find because I found an ancestor and we actually met up in Vancouver and we had a <laughs> we had a conversation over dinner and she started talking about her great uncle John and I didn't have a great uncle John. <laughs> 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 Uh, genealogy can be really, really <coughs> fun and really, really interesting um, and really, really strange. And I remember when I talked with this this young man, Trey, um, I said, the first time you find something that your mother doesn't know, you're hooked. You're hooked forever. And you, and you tell her, did you know that? And, and he was just, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he, he really, um, he's hooked. He's definitely is hooked. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Um, concerning international research, are there areas of the world that are not good for going back and finding records? Ireland's hard because um, the Irish remember their county and the county isn't what you need to find the records in Ireland. And the, and the, the counties keep, cha the boundaries change. I found it very hard to do Irish research. Germany is very good. Um, there used to be, of course, a huge problem with the Iron Curtain, but um, I'm told that you can do uh, research in those areas now. Um, I haven't tried. I've not done a lot of European, because my families go back so far in the US, I really haven't been able to get them out of the US. They're back around 1700, um, and you kind of lose them in there. There's not much in there if they're not really prominent people, and mine seem not to be terribly prominent. They're there, and they're farming, and they're doing their thing, but um, they don't create any records other than land records, and you know, you just get to a point where you, you can't go any further. And those people were so important. And that's what I think when I look back at my family, I didn't realize they fought in the Revolutionary War, and probably yeah. other people did too, even they, if you didn't find them back in England and Ireland, they came here for that reason. I have a lot of revolutionary soldiers on my mother's side. My father's German side was um, German Baptist. They called them dunkers because they believed in complete baptismal submersion. And they were persecuted all over, and then they fled. And they didn't um, give oath and they didn't believe in military service. So his side of the family, I think there's one revolutionary soldier. He must have been a, I don't know, but there's one there. But the other side, I have a lot. And if your people were here at the revolution, they fought. They probably fought. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably fought. And if any of you have seen the um, Outlander series on TV or, um, in books. It, it really is a wonderful series of books and presents um, how things were in Scotland and England in the 1700s and then how people migrated to America. Um, it kind of makes me proud when you think about it. Um, the revolutionary soldiers were, you know, uh, What's the word? <laughs> um, rebels. Um, you know, England didn't think much of us doing that. <laughs> but we don't think of it now, but because we won the war, the, our, our ancestors were heroes. If they had lost, they might have all been hung and none, none of us would have been here. <laughs> you know, it's possible. It was, it was fun, but yes, they're, and they're good, records, if you think you have a Revolutionary War soldier, um, that is a good source to try. And usually I tell, you go back, 
you go from you backward. You don't jump to a family back there and try to connect to it. That doesn't work well, well and you can make mistakes. Revolutionary soldier is a little bit different. If you think you've got one, his records may help you make the connection to him, even if you if you don't aren't able to. Uh, he will have a lot of records. Can I tell one more story? Okay. I can risk <laughs> boring people, but this has just been published in a British genealogical mag a magazine. Uh, about 18 months ago, I had an email from somebody whose maiden name was Julie Rimmer. Ah. And uh, I had no idea, I didn't know any Rimmers at all, but she told me that so she thought she was related. And, and that didn't make any sense. Uh, so she told me a story. For 25 years, she'd been trying to find out who her father was. Her father apparently had appeared in 1937 but had no records, no birth certificate, absolutely zero about him. All they knew was some hints. They knew that on his marriage certificate, he had to name his father. His father was Albert E. Rimmer. And also there was a family story that was something to do with coal, and that she had no idea. But then she convinced her brother to submit a sample for DNA. And lo and behold, it turns out that her brother and I were very close cousins. <coughs> high probability. So we then started exploring about who her father was. And I got to admit, I was holding some stuff back because on my side of the family, my mother was a Winstanley. And she had a brother, Jimmy, who had disappeared in 1937 and had totally abandoned his family, including a three-year-old girl. And didn't relate the two that well at the time. Went back and I actually met with this three-year-old girl who was now 60 years of age. Mm -hmm. And she told me the story that this, her father's name was never mentioned. Absolute anathema because he had abandoned his family. Yeah. But on the other side, the Rimmer side, they raved about this wonderful father. And then we finally <laughs> tied the two together. Of course, DNA was helping here. Yeah. And this man had, and we turned out that Jimmy Winstanley had been married to a woman who was a hairdresser for the Cunard line. And during the 1930s was going backwards and forwards, even though she had a couple of babies. And she was leaving the babies with somebody else. And we think this man got, ultimately got fed up and just abandoned everything and went over to the Riverside. And uh, so everything picked together. Yeah. The interesting thing now is, is, is this man, whether his name was Frank River, Rimmer or Jim Winstanley, would be very proud of his grandchildren. That he did know he had. Because his grandson on the Rimmer side became a director of a major French oil company, and his grandson on the Winstanley side is the bodyguard to the Queen of England. Oh, wow. <laughs> And this shows you the value of, of This shows DNA. you what DNA can yeah. do. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Three, three that's cousins, a good example. Three cousins that he never knew existed. Yeah. Those cousins, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Just, I guess, one little statement and then a question. Okay. Uh, uh, talk about children throwing away records. My mother died in the mid 80s, and I uh, was back in very definitely pre computer, pre internet. Yeah. She had helped people. Uh, research their roots or their uh, genealogy. I had, I still have, two Manila expanded uh, folders with uh, just stuff on our family and uh, letters that she had sent to other people of findings that she had made. Mm -hmm. And so often I feel so sad. I mean, this woman would have just love the internet and all the access yeah. <laughs> that we currently <coughs> yeah. have to mm -hmm. find our roots. Absolutely. You know, all, all, these things were all typed on, on uh, even a pre-electric typewriter, I mean, you know, or, or yeah. handwritten. You know. But she, she had apparently, I mean, she was a DAR person and, and yeah. had done her own research, but apparently helped other people as well. Yeah. So, so that's, that's my little tale. Okay. Uh, my question, uh, at one point, <coughs> let's say uh, probably 15 years ago, 
we went to the Tennessee archives. And but I felt kind of kind of rudderless. I I wasn't sure <laughs> how to make the most of my time there. Yeah. The, any advice? Um. The um, published records for Tennessee counties are in alphabetic order around the reading room. You can just go and pull those off. Uh, they can be uh, birth, they can be um, deeds, they can be anything that that county has published. So that's a very good source. But of course the microfilm collection is huge. And they have uh, a very large collection of newspapers arranged by city um, that cover a huge time period. And there again, you can pick up an obituary. If you know a death date, you can pick up an obituary. Very helpful information. Um, those are great. And they have some things on microfilm from other counties, not a lot. I mean from other states. They have some Virginia tax records, which are really good. Um, if you're working in Virginia, that's something you need to know about because in about 1782, Virginia passed a law and um, they have an annual tax list in every county and they're divided into poll tax and real estate tax and they're annual and that those have all survived because they had a copy at the state level as well as at the local level. So anytime you get an annual record like that, wow, that is really excellent. Tennessee has some uh, tax lists, but they're intermittent and they're not regular, And but Virginia, wow, you can take a census and you know, got people here and 10 years later you got them here and you can look at the people in between and just put those families together. It's really very good information. Um, so uh, I don't know, I would, I would say, and they also have all the Civil War records there. Uh, if you have a soldier that fought, you know, the pension records for Tennessee are there. Um, there's just so much. Um, it just depends on what you're needing. But uh, you just, and I will also say that lots of other states, they have the Pennsylvania, all the colonial records for Pennsylvania. That's a really good collection. Um, more recently, they've gotten a lot of new, new things in for the counties <coughs> or for the states surrounding Tennessee. So it's, you know, that time, first time I visited there, I thought, wow. This is really something. Um, I have one Tennessee line, but I was able to prove that, and, and I'm a, what do they call me? A first Families of Tennessee. I am in First Families of Tennessee. That made me real proud to be coming from Ohio and be able to do that. That was a good one. Yes, I just made me think of something. Uh, someone just asked me this week about getting, how to go about getting the forms for the first family. Is that all online now? Or we, We've got our from way back. But she was just starting you know, to do it. I don't know if they're still doing it. Okay. East Tennessee Genealogical Society is the group that did that. And do you know Bonnie? I know if they're, they're still doing the farms, it? like the first, you know, the very first so, people that still have the farms. I'm not sure about the other part. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. not. I'm just not sure if they're still doing it. But they published a book on it, which um, I know that Ancestry.com has put in their database because I've seen the information in it, and I know there's another place they could have gotten it except from that book that they published. But that was, what, maybe 20 years ago? I'm, I'm guessing. I'm guessing. But Does it bring on a lot of extra work when you're doing this with uh, second wife or second husband or stepchildren? Or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can remember back in the early yeah. days where I'd find a family in the census 
and of course it has the whole family. So there's there's a dad, there's a mom, and there's an eight-year-old child, and six and five, and you think, okay, eight years, let's see, that would be, okay, I'll look for the marriage two years before that first child. That won't work now. That will not work. Now we do have social security numbers, and I just read where somewhere that they don't ever duplicate those. So if that I'm continues, you'll be able to use. The library is closing in 30 minutes. Okay, got 30 minutes. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Um, so it's going to be very different in the years to come. You'll have DNA. You'll have social security numbers, but you also have a lot of mixed families that you didn't have to deal with before. Uh, divorce was practically unheard of. Um, although my, my, no, I'm not going to get into that one. <laughs> uh, uh, it happened. Um, and sometimes people just separated too, back, way back then. But the stigma was so serious. That's why my mother, um, allowed my stepfather, who was after my father died, and she remarried, and uh, he adopted us because of that stigma. And I was always appreciative of that because there was one girl in the class whose mother had a different name. And it was like, you know, that's how different things are from the way they used to be. And some differences are good, some differences. <laughs> Yes. Mr. Masters researched that he's mm -hmm. done. Is that going to be published? He put, he, oh, the, to, what, to purchase? The land record thing? Mm -hmm. No. He swears he will never do another book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, he also wanted to transcribe all those land grants. And I kind of jumped in there and I said, no, we need the index. We don't need all those transcribed. It's just too much to try to do. Um, so he has been working on the index, but no, he swears there will not be another book. But it will all be uh, transported to the Sumner County Ar Archives and will be available there. I don't know if they're going to make it available anywhere else, but it will definitely be at the Sumner County Archives. So, yes, sir. In your research with Sumner County, have you ever come across anything on Jonathan Browning? On Jonathan Browning? Browning. He was the father of John M. Browning, the firearms maker. And, um, I'd have to look. And I didn't know if, which actually led me to another question. Um, later in Jonathan's life, he moved to Utah via Illinois. And he became a Mormon there, Mormon. And, and he was a polygamist. Have you ever had to deal with sorting out families <laughs> of that nature? Um, I have a friend um, who lived in, I used to go to Salt Lake City every winter for about two weeks to do research. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to know people out there. And I had one friend who was divorced who was, had been born and raised into a Mormon family. And she told me how, you know, your, your genealogy chart goes this way, you know, this way. Hers goes whoop, this way because of the multiple ancestors that she has that are the same. I don't have any duplicate ancestors. Some people do where cousins marry each other. That was pretty common back then. And East it was Tennessee, not stigma. yes. Pardon? East, East Tennessee. Well, in the mountains, even even <laughs> beyond even, the mountains, even beyond the mountains, um, first cousins marrying was not unusual. It happened. So then you have a chart that goes back to the two of the same people uh, on your chart, but hers just took a real curve because she had like five ancestors that were the same person. Um, because she did come from a Mormon polygamy family. Uh, she, she married and um, she told me that there, she had no problem getting a divorce. Um, that was not a, an issue. Uh, 
and she was very helpful. I saw some of the tombstones in a cemetery where you could tell it was a Mormon polygamy family because the man was there with his dates. And there's one, two, three, four, five tombstones of women with the same last name as the man and overlapping dates. You could see this had to be a Mormon family because, and often it, w it would say right on the tombstone that she was a wife of this one man. So there were, and I, I think that would be very difficult, but uh, she said, really, it's not. It's just you have to deal with fewer people because you got <laughs> similar answers. <laughs> what can I say? It's been illegal since, um, I think it was um, 1906 that it became illegal, and that's had to do partly with statehood, I think. The U.S. was not going to have a state that, that promoted polygamy. And um, they wanted to be a state, so they... Uh, but I will also say that when I was going out there, which was probably 20 years ago, the, the Mormon um, fundamentalists were, there were still many uh, polygamous families at that time. I don't know if it if there still are or not, but um, we went out for dinner one night with a group of teachers, and um, the person that was telling me this said, talk to the teachers, and I said, what do you mean? And one teacher spoke up. She said, well, I see one man come in, and then a day later, he comes in with another wife and another set of children. So it was going on back there. But that's, it, you know, it, the church considers that illegal, of course. And you're not supposed to be doing it. And probably, probably it's stopped by now, I would think. They put someone in jail. Oh, I forget who that was, but. Somebody called Jessup. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. 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 Do you have a name? The surname is Jessup. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's who it was. Yeah. So that would have presumably ended it. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, we, that's right. They're going to close the library. Well, thank you all.